Wonderful, wonderful. So good morning once more, ladies and gentlemen. Morning, teacher. Thank you very much and welcome to welcome to the very first topic of uh, ATIA.com. So the very first topic here is titled Data Communication Network Basics. It's a very important topic, especially for those ones who are new to computer networks, because it, it introduces you to uh, uh, the very basic uh, concepts of computer networks. So let's, let's do this. So I'll read for you the forward. The forward is always important because it just gives you an overview of what to expect in this topic. So communication has always been with us ever since the origin of human society. Communication has been playing an increasingly important role, especially since human society entered the information age or information era, eh? which is really defined as being between uh, those particular years. So the communication mentioned in this course refers to the communication implemented through a data communication network. It's called a data communication network. So this course describes the concepts related to communication and a data communication network, information transfer process, network devices and their functions, network types, and typical networking. In addition, this course briefly introduces the concepts related to network engineering and network engineers. So when you talk of this course, this course, we mean this topic, are we together? Yeah, so this topic. So in this topic, uh, uh, that is what you're going to, uh, to learn about. So I'll request uh, Dennis to read out the objectives for us. The objectives for this particular topic. Dennis, go on. Okay, please. The objectives. On the completion of this course, you will be able to understand the concept related to communication and a data communication network. Uh -huh. Go on. The second one, to be able to describe the information transfer process. Uh -huh. Third, differentiate network devices of different types and understand the, their basic functions. Exactly, network devices and their basic functions. Uh -huh. What else? understand different network types and topology types. Yes, very important. In routing and switching, we didn't have this and I thought, wow, wow, wow. Why did they leave this out? But at least now we are going to learn about network topologies. Uh -huh, move on. The last one, understand the concept related to network engineering and network engineers. Yes, network engineering and network engineers. So by the end of this, by the end of this training, and uh, even during this training, I'll be referring to you as network engineers. Network engineers. Because you are network engineers, it's an engineering. Building, planning, designing, implementing, and troubleshooting. A computer network is an engineering project. So you guys are going to be network engineers, network engineers. Okay. So uh, we begin by looking at uh, a few of the Huawei device icons. Huawei device icons. So we are going to understand a few uh, devices that are used on a network. One of them is called, one of the most important ones is called a router. It's called a what? It's called a router. So this particular icon with an R, uh, 
with a diamond and an R inside is used to represent a router. So we're going to understand what a router is and the role it plays in a network. The other important device that we're going to be dealing with regularly is a switch. A what? A switch. So whenever you see an S with those two arrows, then it's just a general switch or a basic switch. Sometimes we also call it a layer two switch or an access switch. So you're going to understand why layer two, why access. Then we also have what you call a, a core switch, a core switch. A core switch is uh, 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 a core switch uh, and also an aggregation switch. Uh, they are thought of as switches that can perform layer three functions. So we are going to understand what layer three functions is, but generally they can perform both the function of a switch and a router. Are we together? A core switch and aggregation switches. And then we have an access switch, very similar to general switches, just layer, layer two, layer two switches. Uh, and then this icon here is for stacked switches. Stacking of switches means they're modular switches and you can be able to combine them. So that is what you call stacking, stacked switches. Okay, so I'll describe just a few other icons here. You don't have to get all of them this time. So this one here is what you call a firewall. A firewall, a very important network equipment that is used to secure uh, your internal network or private network from the external network. So we're going to have a look at it just in a few minutes. Then you have this one is also important. It's called an access point, an access point. So an access point is what is used uh, to broadcast wireless network in a wireless local area network. So it's called an access point. Like in this lab, it's here. This thing here, it's an access point. Are we together? Yeah. Then this icon is for a base station. Base station is that thing you call a booster. This Safaricom towers, you call a booster. The correct name is base station transceiver, base station. Then this one is for a general server. Uh, let me see which other one is important here. This one is for an access controller. This one is important because you're going to see it. An access controller is used to control access points. So we're going to learn about that just now. Access controller used to access, to control access points. Uh, then this one, I'm sure you, you know about it, the Wi-Fi signal. The other one that is important is this one, network. Then these ones for cloud. Ah, sorry, I meant internet here, eh? Sorry, internet, internet. It equipment equal than internet. Otherwise, if it's blank like this, it is uh, cloud. Then we have this. Uh, these are what, in a computer network, we call this uh, end devices or terminal devices. They're called what? End devices or terminal devices. Reason being, they're the ones that generate or start the network communication. Uh, so it can be your phone, it can be your smartphone that is, it can be an office IP phone, it can be your PC, tablet, mobile phone, laptop, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the icons that you're going to be seeing uh, in, in these notes and also when doing the lab on ENSP. Anyone with a question? Okay. Yes, teacher. Yes, please go ahead. From the diagram, uh -huh. okay, which device can uh -huh. we come as the workstation? 
which device? Can we term as the workstation? Uh, maybe you can define a workstation. What is your understanding of what a workstation is? Uh, a workstation, according to me, it is also the end terminal. Uh, exactly, uh, exactly. Very correct. So a workstation is also uh, what you call an, uh, uh, an end device or end terminal. So any of this can, can, can act as a workstation. So that's another name, very important. Thank you very much, Maurice, for sharing that. So end terminals can also be termed as work stations, STA, especially uh, when, when we'll be learning about wireless local area networks, we'll be calling them STA. Uh, so workstations, they're simply end devices that can access the wireless local area network. So thank you very much, Maurice, for that. Okay. So the contents of this particular topic, communication and networks, is the very first topic. Then you're going to look at network types and topology types. Then network engineering and network engineers, just the basics uh, 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 understanding of what that particular thing means. Okay, so let's begin by looking at the concepts of network communication. Concept of network communication. Now, before we look at network communication, let's first of all understand what is communication? Now, what is communication? Richard, in your view, what is communication? It is? Exactly. Communication is exchange of information. Exchange of information. So whenever we transfer or exchange information, then we are communicating. Now, this communication can be between people, me and you, like what we're doing right now. It can also be between people and things. Hmm? So you communicate sometimes to your dog. Yeah. You call it. So it can be between people and things. Or it can also be between things. It can be between things, like between your computer and my computer. Uh, you can send me via Bluetooth a photo that you've taken with your good iPhone camera. What to iPhone? You know, some of us have Huawei phones that have better cameras. <laughs> okay, so. This communication, this communication has to be through a medium. Through a what? It has to be through a medium. So any communication has to be through a medium. Uh -huh. Now, so that's the general communication. Now, what is network communication? Now, with that understanding, network communication refers to the communication between terminal devices through a computer network. See, I already told you what a terminal device is. Uh, communication between terminal devices through a computer network. So that is what we call network communication. Now, in its very basic form, in its very basic form, uh, network communication uh, can be thought of as what you call a peer-to-peer -peer network, where we are interconnecting two terminal devices together using a particular link or medium. For example, when you are sending to me that photo that you've taken with your iPhone via Bluetooth, so, so that is called a peer-to-peer -peer connection or peer-to-peer -peer network. Are we together? Because these two devices are on the same level. Is that clear? Yeah, so that is peer-to-peer, one-to-one, same level. 
So at the very basic of network communication can be a peer-to-peer -peer network. Other than that, we can also have uh, this kind of connection where we have, for example, a central device that can be able to share data from one computer to many other computers. Uh, for example, here, eight files are transferred among multiple computers through a central device called a what? Called a what? A router. A router. Uh, So this is another form of network communication. Mm. Now, the other form of network communication can be where we are communicating via the inter internet, via the internet. For example, we want to download a file from a server in the US or in Angola. Mm -hmm. Now, generally, the internet is what is termed as the largest computer network in the world. The largest computer network in the world is internet. And that is the definition, by the way. That is the definition of the internet. Global interconnection of computer networks. Global interconnection of computer networks. Now, as you can see, there are several components. For example, we have the data, and we also have the medium. We also have the medium. As you're going to learn uh, uh, later, you're going to see that the medium can either be wired or it can be wireless. When it is wired, we can either use electrical signals or we can use light signals like laser, for example when you're using fiber. So there has to be a medium. There has to be a medium between uh, 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 terminal devices for communication to occur. Now, generally, it is important that you understand the history of the internet, and I'm giving you that as a, a is it a reading or watch assignment? You should go to, the, to YouTube and search about the history of the internet so that you understand uh, the history, uh, uh, where it started. But generally, you'll, you'll hear of what we call ARPANET. ARPANET, ARPANET. ARPANET is the Advanced Research Project Agency Network. So this was the very first network that was created between uh, one of the US Army bases and a university. So the very first data that was sent between two computers was done via, via this particular research uh, project, the ARPANET. So when you have time, please go and watch the interesting story about uh, uh, the history of the internet. Now, let's look at the information transfer process. Let's look at the information transfer process. And that's why I like these notes because it really gives the, the, the very basic. Now, the information transfer process is not any different, is not any different from uh, uh, an object transfer process. Uh, now look here, we have a, We have a parcel, which is a mobile phone. We want to send this mobile phone to someone who is in Angola. We want to send it to Maurice from Kenya. Mm -hmm. So really, what is the process? How are we going to do that in order for us to, to send it? So number one, we have to package it. We have to package it to conceal the identity of what we want to send. We have to package it so that we can also address it and include Morris details on the package. Then we will take it to a distribution center. 
then the distribution center will ensure that it is taken maybe to the airport and the, that particular courier service will ensure that it is taken to the distribution center in Angola. Then Morris will receive the package. When Morris receives the package, he will tear up the box and remove the contents of that particular package, which is the, which is the smartphone, for example. So information transfer happens in a very similar manner. It's not any different from this. Now let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at it. So now you have some data. You have some data that you want to send to a particular destination. Uh -huh. Now, this original data, this original data is normally called a data payload. It's normally called a what? A data payload. Now, this data payload, we are going to package it. We are going to package it. Now, how do we package it? We package this particular data by including what you call header and tail information. Header and tail information. So we add header and tail information. Once we had header and tail information, then this particular data payload becomes what you call a packet. It becomes what you call a what? A packet. Generally, when we talk about header and tail information, we simply mean that we are going to add, we are going to add to this data payload, we are going to add uh, the destination address. Destination address, source address, so that we can be able to find this particular destination. And so that is what we are adding. Those extra information. We are adding extra information so that this particular packet can be able to get to the destination. And we call that a packet. Now, whenever we add data, so what's the difference between a header and a tail? What is the difference between a header and a tail? Now, whenever we add information before the data packet, is it before or after? Happen even before or after? Eh? Eh? Before. Okay. Whenever we add data on this on this side, we add more information on this side of the packet, then we call that the header. Whenever we add information this side, then we call it the tail. Is that clear? While sometimes, while sometimes a packet might, uh, while sometimes a packet might miss, might miss a tail. All the times a packet must have a. Are we together? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now look. After we've packaged it, we take it to the distribution center. Now the distribution center uh, in a computer network is what we are calling here the gateway router. The gateway router. So it's simply a router. The name gateway, uh, a router is synonymously referred to as a gateway because it's used to get packets away from its original network. It can be able to transfer packets from the network from where it originated to a different network. Are you getting the point? So that's why it's called a gateway. That's why it's called a gateway. Mm -hmm. So the gateway will transfer that particular package to another router. Then that router to another router, that router to another router. So that interconnection of many routers in between is what we are calling the internet. 
And finally, it will get to the router that is connected to the destination device. And that particular router will now send the packet to the particular destination device. You're getting the point. Now look here. So this is the packet. Of course, it has the header. But by the time now, uh, you remember, Maurice had to remove the phone from the package, right? Yeah, so for the computer to be able to see the data, it has to remove the header and tail information. I get the point. Therefore, it will just remain with the data. Now, the data is what you'll be able to see, for example, on your browser. Is that clear? Yeah, so that is the information transfer process. The information transfer process. Now, the other thing that you need to understand here is a technical term that you'll be hearing of a lot, which is called encapsulation. Sorry, encapsulation and decapsulation. Decapsulation. Encapsulation and decapsulation. Of course, this originates from, I'm sure all of you know what, what a capsule is. Huh? Yeah. So really, a capsule is that medicine that I've been put inside. Inside a capsule, eh? <laughs> huh? Inside a capsule. Do, do you know the, the reason as to why some medicines are put inside a capsule? What is the reason? Why do we put some medicine inside a capsule and others we don't? Can I try? Yes, please. Um, some especially the ones that are being put in the capsule. Um, uh. Technically, uh. those medicines are actually intended only to function, yes. to function, yes, um, uh, to function in which way to, uh, to 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 rupture and function where they're only intended to. Oh, okay, okay, to rupture and function where they're intended to. Oh, they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to get in contact with the other parts of the body. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't have a definite answer, but one of them that I read is that because some of these medicines maybe react with air, and therefore they might form a totally different component when they are left outside to react with air. But when I was young, I thought it was because uh, these medicines are very bitter. <laughs> I'm not sure. I've never tried to lick any of them because I've always thought they are very bitter, but maybe they are sweet. So next time you have a capsule, you can try and remove it and have a test. Okay, so encapsulation is simply that. It is putting something inside something else. It is what we are calling here in the object transfer process, packaging. You see, packaging. See, we are packaging this phone. We are putting it inside a box. So. Encapsulation in computer networks is simply putting the data payload, adding headers and trailers on the data payload. So when we are, uh, normally when you are defining this, we use appending and prepending data. Appending. Appending and prepending. <laughs> when we are appending and prepending data to the data payload, then that is what we call encapsulation. When we are adding information on the header or on the tail of the data, then that is what we call encapsulation. The reverse, the reverse, which is now removing that particular data, like what we've done here. Uh, we've removed this header. When we remove it, then that process is called de decapsulation. Okay. So a few definitions. Uh, 
uh, please remember again i really want to insist remember that what do we call this what do we call this the medium eh? so don't forget the medium it has to be there similarly when we are taking the package to the distribution center we take it through road eh? or air but there has to be a medium so don't forget that eh? it's a very important component of the network communication so a few definitions here uh, so that you can be able to understand these terms as we as we describe them so we've already talked of the data payload and we say that the data payload is actually the information that you want to convey that information that you want to send is the data payload then packet packet main difference between the data payload and the data packet is that the packet has uh, the components of a packet packet it has the header it has the data payload and it has the tail so that is what we call a packet 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 then we have the header <clears throat> So we say the header is information segment added before the data payload. Then tail added after the data payload. Information segment added after the data payload. Then we have encapsulation. Encapsulation, we've said is the process of adding header and tail. So when you're adding headers and tail, that is encapsulation. Decapsulation is when you're removing the header and tail from a packet in order to obtain the data payload. Uh, so during the, the decapsulation, you obtain the data payload. During encapsulation, you form a packet from a packet. gateway very important gateway so here let us talk about many things network device provide functions such as protocol conversion route selection and data exchange data exchange so this is simply a router anything that will get packets from one network to another network is a gateway so it can be a router it can be a layer 3 switch gateway then router network device that selects a forwarding path for packets so router will be able to do route protocol conversion route selection data exchange <clears throat> Uh, and of course, we already talked about the terminal terminal device. We've said that the terminal device can also be called an end device or a workstation. It can be your computer, your smartphone, your mobile phone, your IP phone, etc. Any question or clarification? Okay, so let's move on. Now, uh, data communication network, data communication network. Let's look at this term. So this is a communication network that consists of, consists of what? Let's read that together. Routers. Uh -huh. Routers. Firewalls. Firewalls. 
access controllers. AC, is there? Yeah. And we also have A? APs, access points. APs. And now the rest are what we call the terminal devices or end devices. What is the function of a data communication network? To implement data communication. data communication. So normally, normally a, a computer network is designed in a layered structure. In a layered structure. Uh, uh, so uh, at the very bottom, at the very bottom of that particular structure, we have the terminal devices. So here we have the terminal devices, the end devices, the workstations. So they are the ones that will, uh, uh, they are those mobile phones, uh, IP phones, laptops, desktop computers that are in your offices. And so those are the end devices or terminal devices. Now, we have what you call layer two switches that are used to connect to these end devices. And therefore, this in computer networks is referred to as the access, access layer. It's called the access, access layer, access layer. Now, after the access layer, normally we have uh, we have another layer that will now receive traffic from multiple switches that are connecting the terminal devices. So this particular layer is used to receive high, a lot of high uh, uh, and fast traffic. Mm -hmm. And this particular layer is normally called the aggregation. Aggregation layer. Some, some material may refer to it as the distribution layer because it's used to distribute traffic that has been received from the lower layer. Mm -hmm. Then after the aggregation layer, then after the aggregation layer, we have now uh, uh, we have now this layer, um, this one here, which is called the it's called the what? The core layer, core layer. So look here. At the access layer, we have layer two switches. Are we together? At the aggregation layer, we have layer three switches. Are we together? Eh? Yes. Now, at the core layer, the core layer connects you to the internet. It connects you to, it is the boundary between your internal private network and the external public network. So generally, you, you need to understand that. Uh, you need to understand that at the core layer here, you have the router or layer three switches that provide the boundary between the internal private network and the external public network. That external public network is what we call the, sorry, is what we call the what? The internet. The internet. Now, generally, in order to implement security between your private network and the public network, we normally deploy at the core layer we normally deploy fire, firewalls, firewalls. 
So the firewall is used to implement security policies that will either block traffic that is moving from your private network to outside or from outside to inside. Uh, now, normally, normally, so at the very end, and that's why I like this, this course, at the very end, we, we are going to create such like an architecture and configure everything. Are you together? Yeah. So, uh, normally, we deploy, we deploy some servers, we deploy some servers at the core layer, at the core layer. These servers that we deploy at the core layer here uh, are normally servers that we want to, we, we want to give access to external people that are on the internet. We want them to access these servers. For example, a web server that is, is hosting our website. So like we've hosted the MMU website here in, in, in MMU, we have a server room and we have a server. So that server will be, will be deployed at the core layer. So that whoever is accessing it does not get access into our internal network. Now that particular area where we deploy these servers that need access from the public and from the private, that particular area is normally called a DMZ. In full, that is demilitarized zone. Demilitarized zone. Mm -hmm. So as I said, you'll get that this is a web server, this is an email server, because you want your staff to be able to access their email system, their emails, from both within the campus and from their homes, from the internet, via the internet. But we don't want anyone that is coming in, we don't want anyone that is coming in to our network to be able to access this layer. If they're coming in, the least, uh, uh, the only place they can, they can be taken to now is the DMZ. They can only access this, but they cannot go into our intranets. So those are some of the terms, again, that you're, you're supposed to understand. Uh, uh, private. Uh, uh, let me see how I can put that. Let me. Private network, also called private internal network, also called intra. Next. Then you have public, public network, also called inter or so we need to understand these terms. We might be using them interchangeably. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Anyone with a question or a comment? Wonderful. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Come up again. You have uh... okay. So that is a good camera. Mm. So you can call camera. Mm -hmm. You put them on mm. using this MSN. Yes. But once this person gets out of uh, this outside network, the MMU network, network mm. it goes maybe to another network 
mm. be able to access the internal. Uh, so normally, normally we deploy uh, normally we deploy firewalls to protect our private internal network. So the, the function of the firewall, which we're going to see just now, is it creates what we call different trust zones. And if you look at my HCIP videos, you're going to really understand how the trust zone work and how to configure them. But generally, trust zones means we have, for example, the public network as what we call the untrust zone. Then we have the internal as the trust zone. Then we have the DMZ also having a certain value in terms of the trust value. Normally the trust value can range from zero to 100. So you configure different trust zones. So for example, if you're coming from a trust zone, you want to access trust zone, then you can only access maybe the DMZ. You're getting the point. So normally those security policies can either be implemented on the firewall or on the router. Router might also implement some security policies as we are going to see. But generally, for you to be able to uh, uh, allow access to your internal uh, network, like the question she asked, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to access the cameras, CCTVs when I'm inside the network, but when I'm on the internet, I cannot be able to access it. So those policies have to be configured on either the, uh, uh, the firewall or the router in order to allow access. So, yes. Uh, but as, uh, let me just mention, let me just mention for the sake of it, let me just mention that most of the time, most of the time, the router will belong to the internet service provider. And you'll have little access and almost no access and very little control on it. Are we together? Yes, the router has been deployed at your server room, connected to fiber to your ISP, but it is their asset. So what you own most of the time are they? The internal, the switches, the access switches, and the aggregation switches. Most of the time, are we together? So, teacher. Yes. Um, I might have not had that um, uh, question clearly from the lady. Okay. But, uh, based based on based on the experience. And the yes. Work exercise that we've been doing. Yes. A router also can be owned by um, a user, uh -huh. but this is how the, the, the user will own the router. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. After, the, after the ISP has provided the router, yes, there's another layer of a router that you will be required to provide simply because you want to access and manage all the users within the network. Ah, ah, so you have to buy, you have to purchase another router. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. so, so that you have full access and control over and that control. Router that belongs to you now. Okay, okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Maurice, for sharing that. Maurice, maybe you can, you can share with us how much does a router cost approximately? It depends with the type of the router you need. Let's let's say you need a C, CRS cloud router switch, which is about seventy five thousand ten shillings. Uh huh. We've got a router that can do let's say uh, twenty devices, which is around uh, forty nine hundred four thousand nine hundred shillings. Okay, okay, okay. So, thank you very much. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So, Maurice, 
Yes. What is, I have Sarah here who's asking on um, what do you check? What are some of the specifications that you check for when you're going to purchase a router? But I want you to hold that question and process it as we go on. Then we're going to learn about routers just now. Yeah. Then you can you can share some of your experiences on how to select a good router. Is that okay, Morris? That's okay, teacher. Thank you. Okay. So let's look at switches. Let's look at switches. So we already mentioned what a switch is. We, we're going to learn a lot about switches. So this is just the introduction of what a switch is and how it is used. So a switch is a device that is closest to the end user. It is used to access the network and to switch data frames, to switch data frames. So by that really, it means that if you send a packet here, for example, it can be able to send it particularly to this particular device or it can be able to send it to both devices at the same time. So that is what we're calling switching. There is an entire topic where we're going to learn really how the switch does uh, this. But at the moment, just understand that the switch will interconnect the end devices and will be able to forward uh, uh, this particular data from one computer to another or to do what we call broadcast. Broadcast means it comes from one machine. Uh, we send a broadcast uh, a packet. We send to the switch, and then the switch sends to all other connected devices. So that is what we call a, a, a broadcast. And that's why here we have a term broadcast domain. Broadcast domain. So normally, a switch forms what we call a broadcast domain, meaning that you have a set of end devices that can receive broadcast packets from one device. Are you getting the point? So anytime you have an area where one particular device can send a broadcast packet. We've said broadcast packet is meant for everyone, eh? It's like when you're sending a message in a WhatsApp group. Everyone in that WhatsApp group will get that message. So that's what we call a broadcast. Otherwise, we have other types of uh, uh, let me, types of messages. So we just talk of broadcast. We have broadcast. We also have unicast, uh, and we also have uh, uh, what do we call it? Oh, why am I forgetting? We have three types, broadcast, unicast, and multicast, eh? Yeah, multicast. Multicast. So generally, a broadcast message is one to all. This one is one to one. This one is one to a group. So a switch will form a broadcast domain because when it receives a broadcast packet, it is going to send that particular packet to all other connected devices, all of them. Now, generally a switch is also referred to as an ethernet switch. So sometimes you call it that. A switch can be able to do the following data frame switching. It provides access to end user devices. You can configure some basic access security on switches. 
and you can also perform layer two link redundancy. Layer two link redundancy. Link redundancy simply means that you have more than one link. You have more than one link uh, 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 between uh, the switches so that they can either share load or provide uh, reliability. If one link goes down, the other one is still functioning. Normally, normally between, between the layers, between, for example, the access and the aggregation layer, we provide redundancy. We provide redundancy. Uh, let me just show you. Look here. So this switch, this switch is connected to that switch and to also that switch. So that is redundancy. We, we do that to ensure network reliability. In case this link goes down, then the people that are connected via this switch are not going to be isolated. They're not going to lack network services because this link is still working. So redundancy, link redundancy normally uh, is used to improve, is used to improve network reliability. Now, we're talking of layer two switching, layer two switching, layer two switching. So why layer two switching? Because switches operate only on layer two. We are going to learn about that. Layer two is called the data link layer, the data link layer. In data link layer, we forward using a physical address. That physical address is called the MAC address. It's called a MAC address. Generally, generally, every device will have what we call a network interface card. That network interface card is what provides you with a port that you can use to, to interconnect the computer to the switch. A port is sometimes also referred to as an interface. Now, every network card has a globally unique number, has a globally unique number. That globally unique number is called a MAC address. MAC address. MAC means media access control. MAC, MAC address. So the MAC address is, is called the physical address of the device. It's called the physical address because the physical address does not change. You, you can't change the MAC address. Theoretically, you can't change the MAC address. <laughs> I'm saying theoretically, because practically you can change it. <laughs> but theoretically, you cannot change the MAC address. It's your physical address. Uh, so, you can think of it like MMU. Our, our physical address is uh, up on Bagadi across Bagadi opposite KWS, something like that. So that, that's a physical address. Otherwise, PO box, blah, 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 blah. That one, we can change it. If we don't want that number, we can go to POSTA and purchase a different number. Are you getting the point? Yes. Now, that other address, that other address is called a logical address. So a computer must also have a logical address and it is implemented using what you call an IP address. 
IP is internet protocol. So for a computer to communicate, it must have a logical address and a physical address. Are we together? So we, we call this a layer two switch because a layer two switch does not forward data using the logical address. It only forwards data using the data link layer or the physical address using the MAC address. Is that clear? Yeah, so that's why we call it a layer two device. Okay. Any question? I have a question, teacher. Yes, please. In fact, two. One. Uh -huh. I don't know how to raise. I don't know how to raise my hand on this tool. I know Zoom and Teams. Oh, it, it should be the same, by the way. But can I see it really? Oh, by the way. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Go on. Uh, my question is. Uh, uh -huh. The Ethernet uh, switch. Yes. Is it the same as the PoE switch, maybe? Or uh, that topic is coming later? Okay, 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 okay. Uh, so, uh, we've said that this can be called uh, an Ethernet switch, but he's also mentioning something that is important, calling a PoE switch. Eh? So, PoE means power over Ethernet, power over Ethernet, PoE. Uh, so power over Ethernet simply means that uh, that particular switch is also able to provide some power over the link that is used to connect the end device. Are you getting the point? So for example, if this was a PoE switch, if this was a PoE switch, then you can connect it directly. You can connect it directly to an access point to provide wireless network, AP. And this particular access point, you won't need to connect it to electricity. You get the point? Because this particular switch provides power over Ethernet. So that is what we call a PoE. Uh, for example, this lab here, you're seeing that, you're seeing that access point? Yeah, so it's not connected to power. It's just connected to the data cable. That data cable also carries the power. So meaning that that switch that is there in the server room is a PoE switch. So, Maurice, I don't know if I've, if I've, if I've answered your question. You answered my question, teacher. Thank you so much. Okay, welcome. So thank you for raising that. I think it's a very important thing. So those are some of the qualities that you look at. For example, when you're going to purchase a switch, eh? Does it provide power over Ethernet? And similarly, also with CCTVs, uh, you really don't want to you don't want to connect CCTVs over a switch that does not provide power, eh? because it means you have to pull electrical cables to be also close. For example, uh, last year, last year, but one we had we had an access point that required power. That's why we have a socket just there. Are you seeing that? Okay, so let's talk about routers. So we've said switches work at layer two. On the other hand, routers work at layer. Don't worry about that. <laughs> These ones work at layer three. Layer three is called the network layer. We're going to see them, don't worry. It's the next topic. Layer three, the network layer. Layer two, data link layer. 
Mm. Now, these ones, they forward packets using the, the what? Using the IP address. IP address. So a network layer device forwards data packets on the internet. It forwards data packets on the internet. Uh, so network layer device forwards packets, forwards data packets on the internet. So normally based on the destination address in a received packet, a router selects a path. So path selection, it selects a path uh, uh, the packet to the next router or destination. So where am I going to send this particular packet? So the last router on the path is responsible for sending the packet to the destination host. Destination host. The destination host. So these terminal devices, sometimes they might also be called the host, destination host. Uh, so normally, uh, the router implements the following functions. Communication between networks of the same type or different types. Are right, you together? So you can see here, this is one network. This is one network. And this is another network. Are you getting the point? So we have one broadcast domain. A and B. So it's a broadcast domain because they are connected using a switch. If this one sends a broadcast packet, it's going to be sent to everyone else connected here. But what happens? You send a broadcast packet to a switch. The switch will send it out through all the interfaces other than the interface that received that broadcast packet. But the router cannot forward the broadcast packet. It cannot forward the broadcast packet to another network. It, when it receives a broadcast packet, it simply drops it. That dropping of a packet is called discarding in computing. So we're going to be talking of discarding. It will discard the packet. Are we together? It will discard the packet. So just know that a router cannot forward broadcast packets beyond the network from which that broadcast has been generated from. Are you together? So uh, uh, that's why we say that a router is used to break up broadcast domains. It's used to break up broadcast domains. So that's the second point here. It's used to isolate broadcast domains. Then it normally maintains a routing table and it also runs routing protocols. So routing tables is, remember this is the distributor. So, so you have to know that, you have to know where Kitale is, where Eldoret is, so that when you receive a parcel, you can be able to take it there. Uh, so routing table is simply used to do that. It knows different destinations. It keeps different destinations. If this one is going to Kitale, I have to send it via Nakuru. So I'll send it to Nakuru, and then Nakuru will send it to Eldoret, and then Eldoret will send it to Kitale. Something like that, from one town to another to another. So from one router to another router to another router, until it gets to the final router that will send that packet to the destination host. Are we together? So in order to generate and learn about those destinations, they use what you call routing, routing protocols. So we're going to learn about routing protocols. Specifically, we are going to learn about OSPF. Then selecting routes and forwarding IP packets. So sometimes you might have more than one path to the destination. 
this router is connected to two routers. So which one do I send this packet to if it's going, uh, 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 if it's going on that direction? So it's able to select the optimal, the optimal route. So we're going to learn that when we learn about routing. Then it also is used to implement one access and network address translation. So one access means wide area network, which is just the internet, the internet access. So the very last device on the core layer that will connect you to the internet is the router. Network address translation, we are going to learn about NAT. It's simply known as NAT, N-A-T, NAT. So you're going to learn that within the internal private network, we use what we call private IP addresses. But when packets go to the external public network, they have to use a public IP address. So normally the router will convert, will do the mapping between private and public IP addresses. That is what we call network address translation. Then it's also used to connect layer two networks established through switches. Like here, so we've connected two layer two networks. Are you seeing that? We've connected two layer two networks. One layer two network and another layer two network. So any question about routers? Okay, so Maurice, I can, uh, I can invite you now to give a few comments on some of the features to look at when you are buying these devices switches, routers? Yeah, actually, yes, teacher. I might not be having the phone like me, but the few I know I can uh, share them right now. One uh -huh. is, uh, can I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. One of the features you need to look at is uh, the one we've just talked about. Is it a POA or just a normal, uh, uh, a normal uh, switch? I hope uh, Sharon had asked about the switch. Uh, no, it is Sarah. She had asked about oh. the routers. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Some of the features that you might need to consider. Like when you're going to buy computers, maybe you look at the RAM, you look at the storage capacity. Yeah. So what about routers? Still almost the same, but... Um, like how many number of devices are you looking into connecting? That is one. Mm. Mm. The devices that you need to support, that is one. And uh, number two is um, the price. The price also is uh, key. You also need to check on the pricing. Yes. And uh, in terms of speed also, the, the RAM. Oh, okay. Then number three is the coverage. Coverage, if it's... Uh, is it a wireless router? In this case, most of the routers are they're actually wireless. So you look at the coverage. How far can they go in terms of coverage? Okay. Number four, um, you look at the aspect of uh, indoor outdoor. Is it an indoor or an outdoor router? That is the functionality where you want to go and deploy it. Okay. Number five is actually the frequency at which they operate on. Okay, I, I just want to confirm something yeah. from you. M might you be confusing a, a router with an access point? Okay. Because sometimes, of course, we, <laughs> we have that tendency of referring access points as wireless routers. That is one of the things that I had actually <laughs> Because really, really, we, we call them that. Even here, we, we call them uh, wireless routers, but are they really routers that can be used as egress routers to connect us to the internet, to the one? 
So I think the, the kind of router he was, she was asking about was the, the egress router. Ah, okay. uh, and not really access points. But yeah. thank you, thank you for also sharing those those points. I think on that, I need to seek um, uh, some clarification and research as okay. well. You can okay. still uh, if she has. You, you, you can share, you can share. If you get something, uh, you can share in our WhatsApp group. Okay. Any good read that you get about that, you can share in our, in our WhatsApp group. Okay. And, and I think even those prizes that you gave us, most likely they are, they are prizes for access points. Yeah. Yeah, because really routers routers will cost two million, two yeah. million, two million, two point five. Yeah. Yeah, they are quite expensive. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> yes. These egress routers are oh, they're they're expensive. But one of the main things, of course, you, you also have to look just if I can add on some of the things you might have to look when you're going to purchase uh, this equipment is for example the number of interfaces. We've said interfaces are ports. Eh? Normally routers have fewer interfaces than switches. Eh? Switches will come with 12 ports or interfaces, 24, 48, blah, blah, blah. But routers normally just about five or six. So you, you need to look at that. That's one of the main things you have to consider. Then you also have to consider the version of the network operating system that it's running. Because that also uh, determines the level of security and functionalities that you can be able to implement. You also have to consider, for example, is it configurable? So you, you might maybe buy a router that is plug and play. You cannot be able to tweak a lot of things. But uh, you, you have to check whether it's configurable and whether you can be able to also implement some security features on that particular router. Most routers can, can also act as a, as a firewall. Routers can act as so many other things. That's why they're that expensive. Okay, so if, if we get a read about that again, we will be able to uh, continue sharing together. Okay, let's try and move a little bit faster. We've taken too long. Uh, we've mentioned about firewalls. Uh, we, we said you can implement security in routers, you can implement layer two security in switches, uh, but really the main dedicated device specialized for securing our computer networks from the public network, our internal network from our public network, is what we call the firewall, what we call the firewall. Mm -hmm. is what you call the firewall. So the name comes from exactly that, a firewall, and that's why even the icon has a, has a, has, has a firewall. So you can see that. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you can also see uh, uh, that, for example, we have packets coming in, but others might be restricted. And only a few might be allowed to go out like that. So generally, uh, uh, a firewall is a network security device that is used to ensure secure communication between networks. So it will monitor, restrict, and modify data flows passing through it to shield information, structure, running status of internal networks from the public network. So generally, firewalls are used to separate or create different trust zones, different trust zones, and trust zone, DMZ, demilitarized zone, and the trust zone, which is your internal private network. So it's gonna filter packets depending on what you're supposed to access. So some of the functionalities to isolate networks of different security levels, implement access control. So are you allowed to access this or not? Uh, between networks of different security levels, implement authentication. 
implement remote access. So what Sarah was asking about, if you want to access the resources from the internet, remote access, it can also implement data encryption. And in firewalls, we can also create VPNs. A VPN is a virtual private network, a virtual private network. Uh, a virtual private network, it's important that I mention it here. A virtual private network is, for example, MMU has created a campus, another campus in Mombasa. So we have a Mombasa campus. So how can we connect this network with that network so that the operate as a single private network? So normally we connect them over the public network using a virtual private network. Before VPNs, you had to lease a line. They used to, they used to interconnect them using leased lines. So you lease a line for, for, for example, for telecom, you lease some bandwidth, you buy bandwidth, and you connect directly to your Mombasa campus. But nowadays, we simply create a virtual private network. Simply means you're able to create a, a, a private link on the public network, and you're able to interconnect the other side. So those people can be able to call here using our, our VPN, using our IP phone. They can be able to access our internal servers, just as if they're here. Are you getting the point? Yeah, so that's what we call a virtual private network. Then, of course, firewalls can also do nothing, just like routers. Eh? And all these things, by the way, all these things, listen, all these things, other than now implementing trust zones, the router can also do all these things. VPNs, data encryption, remote access, network address translation. But remember, the router's work is forwarding packets, selecting optimal forwarding paths is not for implementing security. So that's why it's advisable that you don't overload it with so much because it's going to deteriorate the service quality. Yeah. So that's why you need to purchase a dedicated uh, firewall and implementing many other security functions. So you can watch my video on HCIP. There is a video that is dedicated on firewalls and how to configure firewalls. Sorry, to that, yes, yes, please. Just, just to expound more on um, the VPN. The yes. The Mombasa College and the Nairobi one. Yes. Does it mean that you, okay, MMU has two firewalls at this particular time? One in Mombasa, another one in Nairobi. Uh, that, that is one scenario that can be implemented, but otherwise you can also use your routers to create a VPN. Uh, are, you, are you getting the point? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you, the best case scenario is that you have firewalls on both ends, but you can still use a router you can still use a router directly uh, on both ends. Sure, thank you. Okay, welcome. Okay, so let's let's look at uh, wireless wireless devices. So over the years, over the years, uh, uh, networks have shifted from being wired to wireless, wired to wireless. For, for very many years, we've had wired network connection, meaning that at the access layer, you are going to be connected to the access switch via a cable. That cable might be a fiber cable, or it might be an ethernet cable. Mm -hmm. But over the years, wireless devices have proven to be more reliable in terms of quick deployment, 
uh, flexible access uh, and it is the only one that is fit for today's kind of network that need to support what we call bring your own device bring your own device most of these devices are wireless devices so we are talking of smartphones we are talking of tablets we are talking of laptops so when we came here in 2010 if you needed to access the network then you needed to go to one of the lecture halls and connect carry a data cable connect to one of the points mm. but right now we're having about over 6000 students so how many ports will you need to to fix you have to do all the trunking how what's the length of cables that you need to uh, uh, to, to implement in order to satisfy this kind of demand so for these reasons we have wireless access points now replacing the wired almost everywhere hmm. so they're very important they're very important now generally uh wireless uh, uh wireless uh, local area networks is is regularly referred to as regularly referred to as what? Why? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. And the standard that implements this is a standard called I triple. E802.11. So we have a family of standards. So you'll get A and others. 802.11a, A, B, blah, blah, blah. They're, they're quite a number. So you remembered, you remembered we say that we have open protocols eh? or open standards, also called open standards. Eh? And we said, that we have organizations that work in, in developing these particular protocols or standards. So one of those, one of those, uh, one of those organizations is IEEE, the Institute for Electronics and Electrical Engineers. I hope I described it correctly, IEEE. Yeah, that was correct. Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers. So this is one of the body you can join as a young network engineer if you need mentorship, participate in the events, conferences, webinars, and be able to learn from experts and also contribute in improvement of these standards and protocols. Are we together? So we are going to meet others, but one IEEE has developed a lot. So Wi-Fi typically is one of their products, free for use. So you can implement Wi-Fi. You can today create a hardware and implement Wi-Fi, anyone for free. So this is one of their standards and this one is the one that uh, uh, supports Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is an official name, are we together? Yeah, it's an official name. Now, generally, uh we have uh, three common devices in a wireless local area network also called wlan eh? so one of them is an access point an access point and the other one is an ac which is an access controller uh, so uh, let me just write that because i think it's important let me let me, let me find right here. So these normally we will call it wireless local area network wireless. So wireless um, devices. So we have access controller. Number two, we have access points.
And of course, we have wireless terminals. On access point, it can be a FAT AP or it can be a FIT AP. So, uh, uh, what is the difference? What is the difference? Now, you, you, you can see we have two implementations here. We have two implementations. So, this first implementation, we are using a FAT AP. Now, the reason I'm it's called FAT AP, it's because uh, it's independent in terms of how you configure it, uh, what can I say? Uh, it, it has everything in it. So you can be able to configure the, the name, the password, and any security features that you want on this particular FAT AP. Normally, we use this FAT AP where we don't have so many people. For example, in our homes, if you have internet in your home, most likely you're using a FAT AP. Or in a one room cyber cafe, you might want to implement a FAT AP because you can be able to configure it everything, everything. The main difference between FAT AP and FIT AP is that in FIT AP, it's like, they're, they're like dump terminals. If, if you've ever heard of that, dump terminals. That is, you, you can't be able to do any configurations uh, on these FIT APs. So normally, with FIT APs, you'll have to configure them through a central device. That central device is called an access controller. So the access controller provides a centralized management of the wireless access points. So normally we implement FIT AP uh, where we have many users, where we have many users, like in a university like this one, uh, where we also require things like high reliability, high performance, easy installation, easy maintenance. Uh, because if we deploy, if we deploy FAT AP, for example, in a campus, it means that in every lab, students will have to enter maybe a different password. Not they'll have to maybe, they'll have to do that. They'll have to have multiple passwords for the different access points, but if we deploy an AC and a FIT AP, then it means that once they have logged in to the network, then they'll, they'll need not to provide any other. If they go to another lab or in another lecture hall, they can continue using the internet seamlessly. They'll simply be connected automatically to that other access point. Are you getting the point? So you cannot deploy, it's important that you understand that you cannot deploy FIT AP alone. Eh? So anytime you are deploying FIT AP, you have to have an access control. Are we together? Are we together? Yes. Yeah. Normally we deploy the access controller at the core layer. You still remember the core layer? Wonderful. So any question? Yes, teacher. Yes, I might be so with so many questions, but I like it. I like it that way. Yeah, maybe something to add on the the, the thing and the. In fact, we, we 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 will have some giveaways not today but later on eh, for the most active students. So keep it up. We will have some giveaways from Huawei. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, teacher. Okay, okay, go on. One more thing I wanted to add on the fit and, um, and the, the AC is that it actually minimizes the fit AP, the AC, it minimizes um, that aspect of IP conflict. 
Aha. Aha. Okay. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, Sarah, you have a follow up question? <laughs> okay. For him too? Oh, Ati, can we, can we repeat what you just said? The AC uh -huh. in the FIT AP, actually, um, a deployment, it helps in controlling, rather minimizing the conflict of these FIT APs. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So what he's saying is uh, it helps to minimize IP conflict, IP address. Eh? See, we say that for a device to access the network, they must have the logical address, which is a IP address. Are we together? Now, uh, if you're having FAT APs, it means that you have to configure the IP range that they have to issue, that they have to issue to every user who comes in. Eh? So when users are moving from one FAT AP location to another, you see there might be a, an IP configuration uh, challenge with that. Eh? The workload increases, and you might also configure wrong IP ranges for the different FAT APs. Are we together? Yeah, but for the FIT AP, you simply configure the IP range that you want it to assign to the end users on the AC. And therefore, it minimizes the chances of making errors. Eh? Are we together? Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, just to confirm. It's just a? Oh, you're asking if the access controller is just an application? Yeah. It's a hardware? It's a hardware. First of all, it's a hardware. Yeah, then, of course, it will have the software now that is dedicated to managing the fit APs. So it's both hardware and software. Yes, normally the access controller is deployed in a server. So you have a server, yeah. then you deploy, you deploy the software. Uh, Hello, teacher. Yes. I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, I want to know if it is uh, recommended to like employ the fit AP and fat AP like in a campus. In a campus? Yeah. Okay. So in a campus, we've said because you want your network to be flexible, you want to reduce uh, the manpower that is needed to maintain the network and also the ease of connection, improve the ease of connection. The recommended way of doing it is using an access controller and fit AP. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that when students are moving from one block to another, they don't have to reconnect. Once they log in, for example, you've set on the AC that they log in with the admission number and a certain password or their student email. Then once they log in, they log in in one, then they can, they can move around the campus and access uh, internet from anywhere where you have an access point. So FATP, you only deploy FATP where we have most likely a single location, like your home or a cyber cafe. But if you're having multiple locations and you want users to access, and uh, then it is important that you use an access controller. Okay. So, okay. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. 
Yes, yes. So does it mean that people are going to to an um, IT guy so that you can give it a clear just so that you are trying to do a process or how does it work? How 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 does it work? Well, I, I didn't quite understand your question very well, mm -hmm. but let me just say this. We've said that on the core layer you can connect a server. You can connect a server. On that server, you can install an access controller software. Are you together? Now, in this server, you can, we're going to learn about DHCP. So one of the functions of the access controller, it can be able to implement DHCP. That is to automatically assign end users IP addresses. Right together. So the only thing, when you do DHCP, you're going to learn how to configure. So normally when you configure DHCP, you have to specify the range of private IP addresses that you needed to allocate to the end users. Are you together? So we're going to learn about private IP addresses and public IP addresses. So private IP addresses are reusable. So you, you don't need authorization to use them. You don't need to be given authorization by anyone to use them. Have I answered your question? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So that means after you install, for example, here, then you learn the robot maybe to the switch, it will automatically assign an IP address for that device. Yes. 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 It will automatically assign IP addresses to the end or wireless terminals, as we call them here, through DHCP. Okay, so let's move on. So the next subtopic, not very long, is network types and topology types. So let's finish this up, and then we can go for a short break. So network uh, uh, networks can be categorized in terms of the geographical coverage in terms of geographical coverage, into three types. The first type is called a local area network or LAN. The next one is called a metropolitan area network or MAN. And lastly, we have the wide area network, wide area network. So normally with the LAN, we are interconnecting computers or servers within a small geographical area, small geographical area, just a few square kilometers. Hmm. Generally, when you have a network in your home, that's a LAN, or in a cyber cafe, that is a LAN, or in one building, like a flat with several floors, that's a LAN, or even within a campus, can still be considered as a local area network. On the other hand, when you interconnect computers within, for example, a city or a county, you see now you're interconnecting several lands together. Then that is what you call a MAN. On the other hand, a WAN will interconnect counties together, interconnect countries together, or even continents together. That is what you call a wide area network. So local area, metropolitan area, and local area network. Then we said we have, how do you spell metropolitan? Metropolitan area network. I'm not sure whether that is correct, the spelling there. Then there's no T. Okay. So remove that T. It is metropolitan network. I can't be able to edit it here. Now, uh, other than knowing the, the the coverage area, it is important that you understand a, how they are the technologies that are used to interconnect them, eh? are you together? Now, 
in order to create in order to create a local area network you might not you might you'll need to interconnect them using ethernet cables all right together or we've also talked about what about wi-fi is that clear now let's go on if you want to interconnect metropolitan area network okay, again you might need to use ethernet but this time this time you have to use higher speeds gigabits gigabits per second gbs or even 100 gigabit per second so that is one and then here you might also have you heard of this have you heard of wimax huh Can someone tell us what WiMAX is? Alain, Dennis, anyone? Yes, sure, I'm there. Uh, tell us what WiMAX is. Uh, so, WiMAX, uh, let me say, like in Kenya, there, Safaricom, uh -huh. can use the WiMAX to put the internet at home for clients. They are using the, the wireless. And uh, the frequency is, is the 5G. Ah, very good. It, it's exactly that. I also wanted to add, but uh, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Uh, uh, 100 megabits per second. So normally in local area networks, we, we use Ethernet at speeds of 100 megabits per second, one gigabit per second. Eh? But because metropolitan area network, when we were, we were interconnecting them, they're carrying more traffic, we need more bandwidth. So normally we, we use 10, but in local area networks right now, we're even using 10 gigs, depending on how huge your network is. But we can use 10 gig or 100 gig. Uh, for metropolitan. So WiMAX, as they have right, correctly put it, here most likely you're using uh, uh, you're using the base station transceivers eh, to interconnect to interconnect areas that are quite distant apart. So, so you're not using access points, you're using the stations. That's WiMAX. Then we have wide area network. The technology that are used to interconnect wide area network, we are going to learn about this. We're going to learn about a protocol called HDLC and PPP, point to point protocol. And we have this one that is called, um, uh, oh, why am I forgetting? I have forgotten HDLC in full. <laughs> but anyway, so we, we, are, we are going to learn about these technologies much later. It's just good that you know that. Okay, so let's move on. Before we go to topologies, uh, here is just an example of uh, learn man and one. For example, in the education industry. Uh, So as you can see, for example, we have a, a, a LAN for a university or a college, LAN for a college or university that are interconnected together, blah, 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 like that. You can see for every LAN, it's layered. Eh? Are you seeing that? Are you seeing the access layer? Are you seeing the access layer? Then we have the aggregation layer. Then we have the core layer. Are you together? Yeah, then from the core layer, you interconnect to the 
to the ISP. Let me just let me just let me just tell you, for example. So here we have the ISP. So our ISP is called Kenet, Kenya Education Network. Kenya Education Network. So the Kenya Education Network is is the ISP that is mandated non-profit making by the government to provide internet connection to all the learning institutions in the country, affordable, affordable. Are, are you getting the point? Yeah, it's called Kenneth. So Kenneth will connect to MNU. Kenneth will also connect to the University of Nairobi, URN. We also connect to KU, also connect to uh, uh, JCOT. We'll also connect to which other one? Just, just, Masi de Mulero, Moy, ETC, ETC. So all those. So I'm just mentioning this so that you see the picture eh? of how, for example, a metropolitan area network is formed. So yes, we have our network at MMU, but now it is the ISP that is going to interconnect all these networks together to form a man. Then our ISP is also connected to another ISP. That ISP is connected to another ISP. Now we have what you call an IXP, IXP, Internet Exchange Point, where now these ISPs are interconnected together and connected to a different country or a different continent. Are you getting the point? So that's how we are able to make the internet a global interconnection of local area networks. So that is really what this particular image is trying to is trying to show you. So in full an ISP is internet service provider. Internet service provider. Uh, yes, please. Uh -huh. You see, there are others like, uh, for example, the distribution. Mm -hmm. Now, do they fall under Kenneth or do they fall under individual service? Okay. So, Sarah is just asking we have other internet service providers like Safaricom. So, do they fall under Kenneth or are they independent internet service providers? So the answer is that they're independent internet service providers. Normally it's the communications authority of a country that will license internet service providers. Uh, so that means you personally can become an internet service provider? Yes, you can become an ISP, but you must have a lot of resources. And the licensing fee is not also that cheap. It's quite expensive. I said Kennet is mandated by government to be non-profit and to provide affordable affordable internet connection to educational education institutions in Kenya, right? So that means an institution like Nakuru University cannot, for example, they cannot license like the internet solutions that they can sell to students Normally, in fact, normally, uh, you, might, um, you might get that most institutions have a backup ISP. So that in case, if you're offering critical services, you cannot rely on a single internet service provider. So in case the services of this one goes down, you can be able to use this one. So sometimes you have one as a backup, then one as the main one. Yes. Does it mean that all their 
<laughs> okay, so she, she's asking really if you hear that uh, the internet connection has failed at MMU, does it mean that the network, does it mean that the internet has failed for all? The, uh, <laughs> the server has failed for those of us who don't understand Swahili. Okay, so maybe. Okay. Yes. Yes, go on, go on. Maybe you can you can help us with that one. Yeah, thank you. Um, there are two ways on how we can look at this. One, the, way mm -hmm. is, the server is down, mm -hmm. and that's a common uh, term that most of us actually normally use. Server zangu is kuchini, or the network is down. Network is Yes. Fine. For, for an institution which doesn't have a redundant, um, a redundant ISP. Or that link. is a that and link, mm. it will be totally down. But for us, for an institution, rather an organization which has a redundant uh, internet or rather ISP, they will deploy what we call failover and they will not experience that downtime. Maybe they will experience some uh, traffic snarl up depending on the the package they are actually using on the redundant. If it is one, 150 Mbps dedicated as the main and 70 Mbps, de uh, 70 Mbps dedicated on the redundant which is now the failover, that's when we'll be experiencing some bottleneck. Have I answered something? Maybe? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, and just to add on that, eh? so MMU here, this is our internal network. Um, this is our internal network. Eh? So the internet has gone down. So failure points can be many. It, it can be very many failure points. It can be our internal link has gone down, or the router itself has gone down, or this link to the ISP has gone down, or this link has gone down. Are you getting the point? Or it can be the router on the ISP has gone down. Or it can be the interconnection between the ISPs has gone down. Or it might be, have you ever heard of a ile kebo ya Mombasa imekatika? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. See, we have the, the cable that interconnects us to, to, to the other continents. That is at Mombasa. It's terminating. Yeah, SICOM. That is terminating at Mombasa. Yeah? Have you guys ever seen it? You can actually see a visual, a visual of it. I'll, I'll try and show it to you. I'll try and show it to you. But you can actually see those cables. So sometimes they are damaged and the entire country goes. Yeah. So failure points can be so many when there's no internet at your institution. Mm -hmm. Yes, Fritz. Or where they get the internet from? Oh, oh. <laughs> I get you. So, uh, how can I explain it? I mean, the internet is not bundles as you as you think of it. It's not like they buy bundles. Hmm? Are you getting the point? It's not like they buy bundles from someone like the way you buy internet bundles for your phone. Really, ISPs, they're called ISPs because they're used to interconnect LANs and now interconnect with other ISPs. And you see now they are spending money because of paying for licenses and also maintaining the infrastructure for doing that. And they're also numbering resources that they purchase in order to be ISPs like public IP addresses, what we call autonomous numbers, which you're going to learn about. So really, that is where they get the connection from. It's by interconnecting with others. So that's where the ISPs get the, the internet from. They interconnect. They interconnect with the others and maintain that connection and also the routers and switches that they use to forward those packets. Okay, so can we move on? 
Okay. Uh, network topology is very important. So a topology is a structured is a structured layout presented using transmission media. Presented using transmission media. What does that mean? Such as twisted pairs and optical fibers to interconnect different to interconnect various devices such as computer terminals, routers, and switches. Uh, so normally, it is important during network planning and network design to do the topology uh, of the network. The topology of the network, you can either do a physical topology or a logical topology. Uh, you can draw you can draw a, uh, it's called physical, physical topology. Or you can do a logical topology. Now, the physical topology of a network will show how the devices are going to be interconnected. Are we together? And the links between the devices. So that's what's called a physical topology. Like this one here is a physical topology right together on the other hand a logical topology will show how the data will flow the ip addressing ip addressing and data flow is normally depicted using the logical topology normally uh, you can there's a software called visual that you can use to draw network topologies uh, but you can also use powerpoint to draw network topologies. So during your free time, please learn how to Google and learn how to use either of these softwares to draw network topologies. Now, we have several network topologies that you need to uh, learn and understand uh, how many are they. We have the star topology, we have the star topology, we have the bus, we have the ring, we have three. We have three, we have full mesh, we have partial mesh. So one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six. So let's begin with the first one. This is called a star topology. Star topology. Does the star topology look familiar to you? Does it look familiar? Where have you seen it before? Which device did we use to create a star topology just shortly? We used a switch, right? So in a star topology, we have a central device that is interconnecting all the other devices. That's what we call a star topology. In the beginning, in the beginning, before we interconnected devices, before we interconnected devices using a central device, we used to interconnect devices like this, using the bus topology, where we just have a central cable, then we interconnect every other device to that central cable. That central cable is what we call the bus. Are you together? But uh, all these, they have advantages and disadvantages, which you must understand. Eh? For example, when we have a star topology, the advantage is that you can easily add new devices. As long as the port is there, you just add a new device. Are you together? That's the advantage. Eh? The disadvantage is if this device goes down, if the central device goes down, what happens? So no communication again. The entire network is down. So that's the problem with the star topology. Bus topology. Advantage, installation is simple. 
the cable resources are saved. You don't have to use so much. Hmm? One of the advantage of the bus topology again is that unlike star, if there is a failure somewhere, then the entire network will not be affected. For example, if we have a failure here, this PC and this PC can still be able to communicate. Are you getting the point? These PCs will be able to communicate. So a failure of a node, a single node, for example, does not affect the entire network. Disadvantage. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think the, the disadvantage, by the way, uh, the disadvantage is again, if the bus fails, then some nodes will be isolated, meaning some nodes cannot be able to communicate. The other problem, the other major problem with the bus is security. Look at how the bus works. Eh? Look at how the bus works. This guy places a packet here. Everyone else is going to get that packet. Everyone else is going to get that packet. Are you getting the point? So if I'm a bad person, I'll look at the destination address, see it's not mine, but I still end up opening that particular packet. So that's a security issue. So that's the problem with the bus topology. Are you getting the point? On the other hand, with the star topology, if you're using a switch as your central device, if you're sending it to this guy, the switch will receive it and deliver it to that person only. It won't send to all the others. Is that clear? So that's an advantage of the star topology. Then you have the ring topology. So with the ring topology, all devices are, are interconnected to form a closed ring from a closed train. So uh, again, advantage of this cable resources are saved. You don't have to use so long cables. The disadvantage of this is adding new nodes is a problem because if you want to add a node here, it means you have to disconnect. You have to disconnect then add. So meaning you have to interrupt services. Are you getting the point? The services will have to go down for some time. So that's the problem with the ring topology. Then you have the tree. The tree topology. Tree topology is almost like the star, only that now. It's almost like the star, only that now uh, it trickles down. Do I say trickle down or bottoms up? <laughs> okay, so this is the <laughs> this is the tree topology. Uh, so the tree topology is a hierarchical star structure. Eh? Hierarchical star structure. And that is what we use. That is what we use most most often only that uh, we provide redundancy but you can see the layers you can see the layers the hierarchies uh -huh. so the good thing with the, the tree topology is that sometimes ah not sometimes but it's easy to expand this kind of network are you getting the point for example if i have another lab and i have an interface here i simply pull I simply pull a cable, connect another switch here, and connect some other devices here. Are you getting the point? So it's quite easy to expand this hierarchical tree structure. Uh, the main disadvantage is just like the star. If a higher hierarchy device goes down, like that one, are you seeing everyone else below is going to be isolated? Uh, so if one node goes down, everyone else is isolated. No network uh, services. Then we have the fully mesh. If you look at the fully mesh, what, what do you think might be one of the disadvantage of this? 
what do you think might be one of the disadvantage of a fully mesh network too much cables yes too much cables is one of them thank you very much another one where are these cables connected the ports are required the exactly exactly yes to each nodes but the ports but the ports so you see a single device has to have all these ports about five ports so it leads to wastage of this these ports and normally ports are very expensive really i i told you that you might have a six port switch 12 24 48 so the higher the number of ports the more expensive the more expensive the device are you getting the point yeah so fully mesh that's the main disadvantage uh cables and also the number the number of ports so the cost the cost is gonna be high the advantage of this full mesh what do you think is the advantage yes if any link goes down communication still continues eh? so fully mesh Fully mesh network topology offers the highest level of reliability. We call it reliability, meaning if failure occurs, it's still going to function. If failure occurs at one point, the network is still stable, so it's reliable. Then we have the partial mesh, where you don't mesh everything, just the important points, just the important points. So of course, the advantage are the same as the full mesh, only that it has a lower reliability compared to the full mesh. Now, in practical, in practical applications, we normally combine, we normally combine uh, these topologies in order to combine their, in order to combine the advantages and reduce their their disadvantages or inadequacies. So you can combine, for example, if you look at this, what have we combined? If you look at this, which topologies have we combined? We have combined uh, three network topology and partial mesh. Yes, I can see three and I can see partial mesh. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, exactly. So we've combined the advantages of tree and partial mesh in order to provide the, the, a higher level of reliability. Hmm. So that, you remember the disadvantage? The disadvantage of this was if this higher level device goes down, everyone is isolated. But now, because we provide a mesh here, if this switch goes down, these ones will still be able to access the internet through this switch. Are you getting the point? Yeah, so we combine the advantages. Reduce risk, increase reliability. So that is it about the topologies. So network engineering. Yes, you have a question, Louis? Yeah. Go ahead. Which medium is used? Oh. For the bus topology, you use either. You, you use either uh, uh, the Ethernet cable, this one is also called the data cable, or you use fiber. I thought the Ethernet cable is connected. I mean, the one connecting the bus. The bus itself. Yeah, the bus itself. You thought? So you will be terminating the exactly you terminate the bus itself yeah. is an ethernet cable but now you've you've interconnected uh, a connection point that is connecting to all the eight wires of that particular cable are you getting the point yeah so that every device just plugs in <clears throat> Teacher, I have a question also on the same. But yes. 
Yes, please. The end, uh, the end terminals on both ends, that is, on bus cable, on bus network, uh -huh. they're both different. They are? By if one there is packet loss, um, or there's too, too much queuing. I think I had something like that. Uh, go on again, go on again. If? If actually the end, the end terminal that you've highlighted, mm -hmm. is, which actually acts as an open circuit. Okay, sorry, we lost you a bit. I think my internet connection has a problem. Or it might be on your end. <laughs> it might be on my end. Um, okay. Please just don't. About uh -huh. you, you have highlighted right yes. now. Can you hear yes. Me now? What, yes, I can hear you. That you've highlighted, actually, they are very important. Uh, um, should I call them devices or uh, terminals? Towards yes. the end of the bus network. Yes, and, and, and what's the name, by the way? I'm forgetting the name of these end terminals. What are they called? I remember something called the Nord, Nord Cups. Okay, okay. I, I, I really can't remember very well. Okay. I'm not also 100% sure. Okay. So if you don't introduce them, uh -huh. there are high chances of uh, packet losses where if devices are like switched off, the, 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 the packet will actually get lost within the network. So oh. If they're open, there's too much queuing, queuing of um, the queuing of data, queuing of packets within the same Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Uh, I think I'm going to give uh, you guys as a reading assignment. You go and read further about the bus network, okay? Yeah, at your own, at your own time. Thank you, Maurice. Okay, network engineering and uh, network engineers, we just finished this. Uh, very fast. We are not going to take much time here. Um, so, network engineering involves planning, designing feasible solution based on network application requirements and computer network system standard specifications and technologies under the guidance of information system engineering methods. Eh? Are we together? Now, uh, for you to be called a network engineer, what does it entail? Or number one, what is network engineering? As we've said, a network engineer has to do network planning. That's number one. Are we together? Then design, then implementation, then commissioning and troubleshooting of the network. So, uh, planning, network planning, design, then you implement, then you commission. That is, commissioning is uh, launching, then you troubleshoot. So these are the aspects of network engineering. For you to be able to do that, there are certain technical uh, uh, capabilities that you must develop. One of them is things to do with the media. That is the medium. Are you going to use Ethernet? Are you going to use wireless? Are you going to use uh, uh, fiber? You're also supposed to understand stuff to do with the equipment room, where you're going to place your server, your switches. Equipment room also has a lot of things, like cooling, electricity, fire alarm, access alarm, security measures, and so on and so forth. So most of these things, network planning, design, implementation, I, I taught them on the HCIP, the last module of HCIP is about this. So you, you can have a look at it. Uh, we are going to learn about wireless, local area networks, routing, switching. 
So you're going to learn about this. Those are some of the things you also need. Storage. Huawei has a Huawei has a certification on storage, knowing how to deal with storage. Security, it's a totally different certification. Uh, applications uh, that need to run on your network and how to calculate and know the data paths that your network is supposed to go through uh, in order to be reliable and fast and efficient. So that is what it entails. Quite, quite, quite a lot. Network engineering. So who is a network engineer? Who is a network engineer? When we call you a network engineer, who are you? So network engineers are technology professionals who master professional network technologies. Uh, so the comprehensive capability models for network engineers include, you need professional knowledge, you need basic qualification and professional skills. So some of those professional skills, as you can see, team collaboration, we talked about this, soft skills, business management, presentation capability, are you able to communicate, problem solving, communication capability. So those are the professional skills that you need. Uh, basic qualification, learning competency, information collection, service awareness, values, etiquette. Professional knowledge, technical knowledge. That's why you do this kind of training. Knowledge about the products and the options you have. Engineering knowledge, that is planning, designing, uh, implementing, commissioning, blah, 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 engineering. Industry knowledge, the trends, of the industry and where it's going to, and also process specification. So those are some of the things that you need to consider as a network engineer. So this is what they are calling the Network Engineers Technology Development Plan, where you move from micro, a macro, to micro and it, to the details, then back to the macro. So what, what do you need to know as a network engineer? Hmm? Routing and switching, for example, how to perform, verify and query your SPF configuration, for example, when it comes to routing. And then protocol mechanism. This OSPF, how can you be able to uh, 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 configure and optimize it? Uh, then packet and underlying mechanisms. Now you need to understand that particular protocol and the details about that protocol. So we are going to learn about these protocols in detail. All the messages that are involved in that protocol, all the fields that define that protocol. Then overall capability. Can you now be able to design a solution, plan, implement, troubleshoot, and optimize that particular protocol? So this is the technology development plan, and this is how these knots are organized to help you to become network engineers. Uh, so generally, uh, Huawei will provide you with, uh, uh, with the training materials, and you'll be able to do the certification uh, exam. And it also provides you with a career development plan where you'll be able to move from one level to another. For example, from associate to professional, from professional to expert. So this is the Huawei certification uh, portfolio, uh, where we are and what we're dealing with right now is the Datacom, which is placed here. So all these are placed under the IT infrastructure certification. IT infrastructure certification. So we have others. 
I want to tell you that you have two ways of improving your career after doing Datacom. One of them is you do other certifications that are related to Datacom, or you go deeper by doing the professional level or the expert level of Datacom. So the other ICT infrastructure certifications that you can do that are highly related to Datacom include the wireless local area certification, WLAN. Uh, of course, all these are related, but I'm just saying uh, for a start, you can do wireless, then you can also do security. Very important, cuts across. If you want to work in data centers, you might want to do the one in storage and also data center. So right now, at MMU, we offer Datacom, we offer security, and under platform and service certifications, we also offer AI, AI training. So we have an instructor for security and an instructor for AI, and two instructors for Datacom. So really, it will depend with your interests, uh, but make sure you, you look at the next level and what next. Uh, there's a meme I saw, uh, uh, I think two weeks ago. It's not really a meme, but it's a comment that someone had made, I think, on Facebook. Uh, and that person had said something like, uh, if you think it's if you think it's challenging and frustrating to see how other people are progressing uh, in terms of the pictures they post here and how they're succeeding in life, so that person was just saying, if you think that is demeaning, try going to LinkedIn. You go there and you find people have six certifications six certifications. So do you think you can compete with that kind of person for, for, for the same job with your single certification or no certification? Eh? <laughs> so you really need to look at what's next. Don't be comfortable. Don't be comfortable. It's a highly competitive world right now. If you have the chance, you have the money and you have the passion, go for it. Improve your skill day by day. Never stop learning, never stop learning. And I highly want to discourage, especially the young trainees here. Eh? Don't finish your degree, you've not even worked in the industry, you go do a master's, what for? Unless you want to become a teacher like me, don't do a master's. Do professional certifications. Are we together? The industry doesn't need your it doesn't need your masters, but academia needs your masters. So if you want to be a teacher like me, I'm not saying teachers are less of, but are you getting the point? Yeah, depending on what you want, the path you want, please, please, please do professional certification and don't stop at the first one. The first one is supposed to open you up to doing others and others and others. Yes, you have a question or comment? Yeah. So you want to say that uh, certifications will improve your job opportunities and having a master's? In fact, in fact, let me say this confidently. Having a master's in industry will reduce your chances of getting employed. Are you getting the point? Mm -hmm. yeah. But having a certification, you see, many IT industries right now, in fact, are removing that caveat of having a degree. Including Facebook, Google, all of them have removed that caveat. You go to an interview and they don't want to look at your papers. They're not really interested. They just give you a task to complete. Are you able to complete it? In the IT industry, it's, it's what you can do. They're called skills. So, I'm not demeaning masters, but I'm just saying professional certifications will give you a better grounding on hands-on skills than a master's can do.
sawa sawa and don't settle at one so which one is the next one for you just answer yourself which one is the next one after datacom what next will you go to hcip datacom will you take wireless lan will you take security storage data center which one So far in Kenya, we only have uh, two HCIs for routing and switching, not data common. Two HCIs. Yes, two. Teacher, you mean engineers? Yeah, who, who, no, who, who've done the expert level of routing and switching? That's, that's what I'm asking. Two? Yes, we only have two. I should be there in the next uh, few days. Eh? Amen. <laughs> And in, in fact, in fact, Huawei normally rewards anyone that gets to that level. In one of the events I was in in 2019, I think the guy was awarded 600k or something. He was the first that time. And then last year, uh, there's a lady who, who became a HCIE, routing and switching. So when you get to that level, you get to the level of a consultant. Are you getting the point? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. R for Cisco. Okay. Will you be able to configure that Cisco switch? Okay. Uh, I wish I would have said this offline during the break when you are taking tea, but let me just let me just hit it. <laughs> uh, I did Cisco one and Cisco two. Uh, then I. I, I I wasn't able to, to continue. Of course, right now I'm biased. I'm biased towards Huawei. Uh, because I love it and, and I'm certified eh, on it. So this is just a personal opinion. It may not be accurate, but it, it's a personal opinion. Eh? So number one, you, you don't need to worry. As I said, these standards are open standards. Eh? Number two, what differs is their configuration commands. The good thing is that on the internet, you get guys who've interpreted uh, and compared commands. Commands for Cisco and Huawei. It's such a document that I had. I think I'm going to look for it and, and find it. Eh? then you're going to get like that the commands don't differ so much. It's just wordings, just English. Maybe someone says display this. Another person says view this. Are you getting the point? So the commands don't differ so much. The other thing that will differ is now the proprietary, the proprietary protocols. Some of them create extra protocols that are owned by them. Eh? So those ones you'll have to learn. And you can always learn on the internet. Are you getting the point? Now, yes, I agree with you. Cisco devices are largely used in Kenya. But I can tell you that uh, Huawei over the years have also been very aggressive. And that I say because of the kind of projects they've done, for example, in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So for example, the entire SGR SGR project, ICTs done by Huawei and their partners. Uh, the, the transport uh, security system, these cameras done by Huawei and their partners in Kenya. Uh, 
Safaricom 4G network. And now they're working on 5G done by Huawei Kenya and their partners. On in every, each and every of these base stations, we have a Huawei route and switch. On those cameras, most likely we have a route and switch on that cabinet that you see. Uh, they also did the NOFB project, the National Optic uh, Fiber Backbone Infrastructure which really is the project that took fiber to all the counties in Kenya. And therefore they are the ones and their partners, the equipment are being used in counties. Counties are also providing network and internet connection to hospitals. So most county hospitals are using Huawei switches and routers. And I can tell you they provide quite superior, uh, superior network equipment. So uh, I don't know how, for how many more years Cisco is going to be dominant, but I can tell you Huawei are coming up quite aggressively. So it's just a matter, just a matter of time. And that future is now. <laughs> and that future is now. I can tell you that future is now. <laughs> because really, these guys are the owners of 5G network technology. And you can see how worried Trump was because of that technology, because they know they're going to dominate the world. And not really a monopoly. We have other vendors other than Cisco. Which other dominant vendors do we have for network equipment? Anyone knows? Nokia, uh, is it Ericsson or I can't remember the other name. But we have others. Ubiquity. We have other switches and routers that are very common here. Are we together? And then with, with most vendors right now, uh, they're also providing a web-based interface that you can use for configuration. So in the near future, it's not going to be very difficult to, to configure these devices. So once you have the basic skills, it's going to be a little bit easier to handle devices from any vendor. Are you together? Yeah. So, so Mm -hmm. Okay, let me give you an example of a hollow. Mm. A hollow fire control fire control fire. Oh, fire. Okay. 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 Uh, not really. Maybe we can discuss that over over the break, so that we wind this up and at least take a break, then come back and continue. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. So someone can take up this question. Maybe someone that is online. Who who have we had? Sandra. Sandra, we've not heard you. Yes. Uh, this one is a simple one. Please take it up. Uh, highest reliability. Is it the full mesh network? Exactly. It is full mesh network. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So in summary, this section has described the network communication and data communication network, and also the basic communication network, the basic function of the data communication network. Uh, it has also introduced you to the various network devices. I'm sure now you understand what a switch is, what a router is, what a firewall is. And we also learned about LAN, MAN, one and the various network topologies, the advantages, 
and disadvantages. Okay, we've also seen that in actual networking, we actually combine uh, the different topologies in order to achieve maximum reliability. We have also described what network engineering is and what network engineers require. And we've also seen how you can be able to progress through the Huawei Datacom certification ladder. So that is it. Thank you very much for your active participation, for your questions and contribution. Asante Nisana.